have the words of that song is, is it just a prayer in our lives that in you alone is our hope found lord i just ask you that you would just speak to hearts here this morning lord as we just sing these praises to you these worship songs to you that the words of the songs and the scriptures that we're going to hear this morning would just penetrate our hearts and we would recognize and realize that it is only in you that we have hope and lord if if as your word says if our only our, our only hope is in the this life, this life only is our hope that we above all men are most miserable. So we thank you that we just have you as a, the author and the finisher of our faith who came and, and loved us so much and died on the cross for our sins that we would just have the hope of eternal life with you. So Lord, we just thank you for that. We just praise you for that. And Lord, as we just worship here together this morning, we just ask that the words, of, of, again, of your scripture, of, the, of your holy word would just penetrate our hearts and, and that we would just be forever changed by what we hear here this morning. We just thank you. We praise you for this opportunity to worship you and lift up the name of Jesus. We ask all these things in your name. Amen.
what I, he's just said there's some things that come to mind there's some things that need to be explained as a result of all that and let's just take a look at the, the remainder of that passage uh, here this morning um, the beginning there at verse 31 what then shall we say in response to these things if God is for us who can be against us he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword as it is written? For your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life Neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is such an awesome passage of Scripture that we should be able to just close up our Bibles and go home. But I will speak a little bit on it. And, and so, and so uh, this passage that, that probably is one of the favorites of many people, because of the incredible promise that, that, is, that is found in it. And it's, it's, there's four general questions that Paul is going to address, that he's going to, to present to us. And you're going to see that he's going to use something that he has used frequently in the book of Romans, and that is the, the, a courtroom kind of analogy. He's going to talk about the, the whole idea of, being, of going to the court, of being accused, of being ch charges coming against us, being condemned. He's going to use that in his, uh, in his uh, example, his explanation to us. And so the first question is this, who can be against us? Now, you might hear that and say, doggone it, i got lots of people against me. I've, I'm facing people against me all the time. And yet he's saying, who can be against me? And the, and the question doesn't mean, isn't indicating anyway that, that there's nobody against us. What he's saying that is, if God is on our side, if God is for us, what in the world is the significance of anybody being against us? It's really the, the, the argument that my dad is bigger than your dad. That, that, that I don't have to worry because, because he's got my back. When I was a kid and my grandparents lived up the road about a, a mile from us, and it was on the back road, and we'd walk to my grandparents' house. We walked by this house, and it was abandoned, and it was dark, and it was scary. And my, and my siblings and I were certain that it was haunted. And so we would walk by that house, and, and, and we, it, was, it scared me. I was nervous. And in fact, if we were going by like at dusk or something like that, it was even worse. 
I mean, we whistled past the house, whistled past the graveyard because, because of the, the fear. But every once in a while, our dad would walk with us. And when my dad walked with me, I didn't fear the house. It didn't bother me. It didn't concern me. And so, and so because he was with me, I knew I didn't have to fear because there's nothing in that house that he couldn't handle. And, and it is that same idea that Paul's telling us here. If God is with us, if he is for us, it really doesn't matter what we encounter because he is with us. And, and the, the, the truth is that people are against us. That, that, that life is hard, that life is painful, and yet if, if God is with us, then does it really matter that much? You know, if you go back to, why is he saying this? Go back to verse 28 where he says this, everything, the good and the bad, the most horrific circumstances in your life, or the greatest circumstances in your life, whatever they are, God will use them for good, and God will use them to conform you, to make you into the likeness of His Son. And what He's saying is, if that is true, if that is true, then it doesn't matter what comes against me, because God is bigger and more powerful and, and able to take any circumstance, anything, and make good things come out of it. And so, He continues in verse 32 with this, he says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? How do I know that God is for me? I mean, you might be sitting here going, I don't see it. I'm not experiencing it. It seems like not only is the world against me, but, but God is against me. And, and you might say, I don't see any proof. I don't see any evidence that God is actually on my side, that God is for me. And yet, in verse 32, he presents the evidence. He presents the proof. The truth that proves that God is for you, and God is for me. And that is, the evidence that God is for us is Jesus and the cross. You might say, I don't know, I have no clue, I've never seen anything that would indicate to me that God cares about me at all. And yet the greatest truth is this. His love for you was so intense, it was so great, it was so overwhelming, that he sent his son Christ to die a painful, horrible death on the cross. That is how much he loves you. And so what Paul is saying, if that is true, if that is true, if he would do that for me, then I know God is for me. I know that God is on my side. And it doesn't matter who is against me. In fact... As we look through these responses, it's not so much that Paul is saying that nobody's against us, that nobody accuses us. Really what he's saying is that with God, it really doesn't matter who's against me. And it doesn't matter who accuses me. If he loves me that much, then I know he is on my side. Verse 33 then says, Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies he continues in this courtroom scene. It's as if someone has accused you of something. You have been brought to court. They've drug you before the judge. And someone has made an accusation against you. And, and, and Paul is saying, who can accuse us? Who can, who can do that? Who is able to do that? So the, the question, the second question is, who can accuse us? And, and, and you might say, I know lots of people that accuse me. I know lots of people that say things about me that don't like me, that are harsh to me. And yet his point is, is not to say that no one accuses you. It's saying the only one who can accuse is God. Look at Isaiah chapter 54, verse 17. Another verse that you've probably heard before. But it says this, No weapon forged against you will prevail. And you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And this is their vindication from me, declares the Lord. Why does it matter? Well, the truth is this, according to the scripture, that every accusation that's brought against you as a believer, and I believe we're talking eternally, but to a certain extent uh, here practically on this earth, 
but every accusation that is brought against you, God will render it ineffective. God will declare it null and void. And the reason that the charge doesn't matter, because it is God who has declared you righteous. God has said, you are righteous as, as my child, as a follower of me. And so if God has declared you righteous, it doesn't matter what anybody else in the courtroom has to say about the matter. It's really kind of a, an, an example, an illustration would be our Supreme Court. If you have, uh, if someone charges you with something and they take you to court and you go into the Huntington County Courthouse and, and Stuart Kurtz declares you guilty, you might say, well, I'm not guilty. And so I'm going to appeal to a higher court. And so you proceed to the next court, wherever that might be, the next appeals court, the state supreme court. And as you work your way through the court system, and, and you who maybe are innocent, and the judge is saying, no, you're guilty, and you keep appealing it to a higher court. Eventually, you arrive at the Supreme Court of the United States, the highest court in the land, and you plead your case to them. And if the Supreme Court says, you are, you are free, you are innocent of these charges, it doesn't make any difference what any other judge in the line of things had to say because the Supreme Judge has spoken, the Supreme Court has spoken, and so all other accusations are rendered ineffective. And we have God as the one who has declared us righteous. So it doesn't matter what anyone else has to say because the Supreme Court, the Supreme Law, the Supreme Judge has rendered a, an innocent verdict, has, has, has determined that you are righteous, and so you're not guilty. And so, it doesn't matter what we are accused of, because God has declared us righteous. So, we've worked our way through those early stages in the court, and we arrive at that condemnation phase. That's where the judge looks at you and says, you're guilty, and you're going to be punished for that. It's the condemnation. And so the next question that we find is in verse 34. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. So the question, who can condemn us? Well, ultimately, let's look at who the real accuser is. Who the real individual is that's trying to condemn you. Look at Revelation chapter 12 verse 10. And this is a picture that will occur someday in the future. Chapter 12 verse 10, then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his, his Christ for the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. The ultimate accuser, the one who is attempting to condemn you, to condemn you to hell is Satan himself. It is, it is his, he is the one appearing in the courtroom across from you, and he's saying, this person, this Dan Mansberger, is guilty of atrocious and horrible things. He deserves to be punished. He deserves eternal damnation, is what he deserves. And, and yet, in that courtroom is Christ. And it says in that passage that he has interceded for us. And even though the charges are true, this is what I deserve. Jesus has stepped in through the cross on my behalf and he has declared me righteous. As his child, he has said, there will be no condemnation. There will be no punishment. And so, we are determined to be righteous and through Christ, we cannot be condemned. In fact, it's interesting that Romans chapter 8 begins with this passage. Romans 8.1 says this, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so he began with that, and now he's, he's finishing up, he's closing with the, just the practical truth of that, that no one can condemn you because Jesus has declared that you're righteous and you will not be condemned. And so why is that? How is that possible? Or why is that even true? 
Well, it's really found in the, the verses, the remainder of the verses. And if we look at, at verse 35, it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? The reason that Jesus did what Jesus did, the reason that you will not be, it doesn't matter who's against you, the reason it doesn't matter who accuses you, the reason it doesn't, it makes no difference that someone, that Satan wants you condemned, is because God's love for you is so great, it is so intense, that he would not permit that to happen. His love is what prompted him to send Jesus to this earth. His love is what holds you. His love is what saves you. In fact, if we look down through the rest of that, the question is, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? He's presenting that, this rhetorical question that what could possibly separate us from Christ's love? And then he begins to answer that. Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life Neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's God's eternal, immeasurable, incomprehensible love that made it possible that you will not be condemned, that I will not be condemned for, for, for the sins. Now, I point out, it says, for those who are in Christ Jesus, because there will be those who are accused, there will be those who are condemned, those who are not in Christ Jesus. But for those who are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. And it says that because of that, because of that love, it says this, you are more than conquerors. Now, that word only appears one time in Scripture. The word more than conquerors is actually only one word in the Greek. And it only appears one time in Scripture, and it appears here in, in Romans chapter 8. And it's, it's the word conqueror with a prefix on the front of it. And that prefix is hooper, or which, which is where we get the word uber, which is actually a German, German word that means more than, superior, extreme. And so what he's saying is you are a supreme conqueror. You didn't just win, you won convincingly. It's a, it's a smackdown, it's a... It's a shut out. It's a, an absolute unscored upon. It's a, it's a complete, total victory. And, and he uses that word so that we understand that. It's not about just squeaking by. It's not like you're just getting in by, uh, you, you know, uh, just by a hair. God completely defeated the work of Satan. You know, my my daughter, Danny, goes to Calvary Christian Academy. And uh, they have a theme song. Their team name is The Conquerors. And it comes from Romans chapter 8, verse 39. And they sing their theme song. And their theme song, some of you might know, it's a hymn. It's more than conquerors. I never had heard the song before, but, but, but it, it's a, a, a hymn. And I, I don't remember the words, so I made up my own for Danny. And, and, I, and I sing this to her every once in a while. She's not here, is she? She's down in the nursery. And, and, I, and I sing this for her, and I promised her this. I said, you know, when you graduate from Calvary, I'm going to stand up at your graduation, I'm going to sing this song. She said, you are not. <laughs> but here's how it goes. We are more than conquerors. Conquerors are we, and we will stomp on you, and we will conquer thee. Now that's, and I, and I sing that song to her. I sing that song to her to, to, and it, it makes everybody laugh. And, and, but as I was preparing the message this week, I realized, doggone, that, that is accurate. That's the truth. That is the reality of what. Paul wants us to understand that, that we are, it, it, he is stomped on. That, that God has declared a complete, total victory. And, and what a, a great truth that is. And so, 
Look at what he talks about here. He, he, he brings up all these hard things in life. Why? Because the truth is, most of the time, I don't feel like I'm a conqueror. Most of the time, I feel like I have been conquered. That I am, I am on the losing team. And he goes through all these hardships and these difficulties and these pains. And he says, in spite of that, you are more than a conqueror. And so as you, you know, if you're like one of these people who likes to write in the margins of your Bible, I would like to, you to like, think about whatever it is that you're feeling conquered about today. And you just write that in the margin of your Bible. And then you read that in the context of that passage. If your thing is not listed in that, that list that Paul gives, put your own in there and know this, that in that circumstance, in that difficulty, in that pain, you are more than a conqueror. What, what a, a great truth. Corey Ten Boom, some of you probably are, are familiar with. She was a, a survivor of the Holocaust and, and was in a concentration camp in Germany. She was a Christian. And yet, somehow she survived. Somehow she thrived in that circumstance. And this is what Corey Ten Boom said. She said, more than conquerors, it was not a wish, it was a fact. We knew it. We experienced it minute by minute in ever-widening circle of help and hope. And, and we need to understand that in that same way. This isn't a wish, this isn't a hope, this is a truth, this is a fact. It changed the way she lived every day. And it should do the same for us. As we, as we close today... What is it that you're feeling beaten down and, and, and hurt over? And just claim this absolute truth and promise that, that you are more than a conqueror in, in, in Christ Jesus. That that would be so true in our life that it changes the way we live our life. That's what Paul desired when he wrote this to you. It's what he desires for every Christian who lives today. You know, today is a communion Sunday. We're going to have communion. And, and what, what a great, great text to, to, to pre preface our, our communion. This great truth, this great promise of, of victory and, and conquering. And as we, as we take communion today and we reflect on how that happened, how did I become a conqueror? It was through Christ. It was through his blood, it was through his death on the cross that I am a conqueror. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you today for this wonderful passage of scripture. Thank you, God, for this great truth that, that sometimes seems so elusive, seems so absent from our life, but that does not change the fact that it is true. Lord, that we would live our lives as conquerors, as victors, trusting in what you have done, Lord, trusting in the, the work of, of Christ on the cross and, and living every day as a conqueror, as a victor. We thank you and we pray these things all in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to move right into our, our communion time and I want to share a passage of scripture and 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul gives us some insight into um, why we do communion, what communion is about. And so I'm going to read uh, beginning at verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Four great truths about uh, communion that I just want to point out. Why we do communion. The first is, Jesus said do communion. Jesus said do this 
And so because he has said it, it's a command for us. We are to follow through with this. We are to, to at a, a regular interval, do this together. Take the elements and participate in, in communion. And so we do it as an act of obedience. The second reason is it's an act of remembrance. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. It's a way of reflecting on what he has done. It's a way of reflecting on the cross, on his blood, on the pain, on the great victory that we have as a result of, of, of him. So we do this as, as a way of remembering. And, and the next thing is he says that when you do this, you are proclaiming the Lord. You are, you, it is your sermon to the wor- world. It's your sermon to the, everyone who's here that I believe this and I agree with this. That this is who Jesus is and this is what Jesus has done. And finally, it's an act of examination. He says, don't do this when when your life is, you're not in that communion with God that you should be. And, And I don't think he told us to keep us from doing it. I think he told us so that we examine ourselves and we get ourselves in the right, uh, in, in right with God that we can do it. If you sit here today and you're thinking, you know what, there's things in my life that just, just would prevent me from being able to participate today, I'd ask you to do this. In, in, in a moment that you just prayerfully, as we prepare to take the, the elements, that you prayerfully deal with God on those things. Those things that you're struggling with, those things that are, are painful and harmful to you, that you allow God to deal with them in your life so that you can participate in this uh, time uh, of fellowship and communion together this morning. The church invites all who repent of their sins, who place their faith in His person and saving work on the cross, and who remain in the fellowship of the church to come to His table. We do so looking back with thanksgiving for His atoning death on the cross to forgive our sins as well as looking forward with anticipation to his promised return for his bride, so we can celebrate together the Lord's Supper. So we invite all who know Christ and are part of his, of his, his church to participate with us in his presence. If the, um, the leadership team could come forward and we will pass the elements.
this in remembrance of me. We desire to partake of the Lord's Supper. Having exercised saving faith in Christ, we now receive the bread and cup as indicated in these words of Scripture. I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the cross. We thank you, Lord, for the incredible, immeasurable love that you have for us. We thank you, God, that in response to that love, you made a way for us to spend eternity with you. And we thank you, God, for the incredible sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. Today, Lord, as we take this wafer, that, God, we would remember the incredible sacrifice and pain that you experienced to restore ourselves to you. We thank you. And we pray these things all in Jesus' name. Amen. Take and eat, remembering and believing that the body of Christ was broken for us, his bride, to provide complete forgiveness for all our sins. For the privilege it is to remember, to look forward, God, to that day when we 
participate together as one body of believers eternally with you. Thank you, Lord, today for the blessing it has been to be together. And we just pray these things all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand and let's sing through that chorus a couple of times. Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table. Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, once your enemy, now seated at your table. Jesus, thank you. strengthened, encouraged, ready, God, to, to live for you, to serve you, to go wherever you call us to go, to do whatever you call us to do. And we go in your strength, in your power, in your might. And we thank you. And we pray these things all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.